Acts chapter 2 verse 1 through verse 4 and when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the fill the all the house the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance I'll go back to verse 2 for the point of my lesson tonight and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I won't uh, cause you to exhaust your neighbor tonight, but it is you and tell them, don't lose the sound. Don't lose the sound. Don't lose the sound. You know, the foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith um, is built upon the Torah the narrative of God's chosen people and we call them chosen although that title of being chosen looks very contradictory in the book of Exodus because although they're chosen they're in captivity and I think it's important that we have a discussion about that because oftentimes our environment or even our ministries don't look like our calling how can you be so anointed <laughs> And be so dysfunctional. <laughs> Come on, we're some anointed people in this room. And there's a lot of gifted people in this room. But if you be honest with some of our giftedness, there's a lot of craziness. You know? It's only grace that masks some of that. Right? You know, grace is the makeup that makes it look good. But if people knew what was under all of that... You know, I, I, I'm anointed, but sometimes very annoying to my own self. We're all walking out some sort of uh, inward contradiction. Because I'm looking at some wounded healers in here. You don't know what I mean when I say wounded healer? That means you can lay hands on other folk. You can speak deliverance over other folk while you still got to deal with your own personal captivity. I'm not screaming, but I just need y'all to be honest with me in here chosen but captivity yeah, yeah. and I want to have that discussion with you because without having that uh, understanding it will make you question your identity in Christ yeah. really growing up in holiness you know uh, yeah I do love those songs saved all day yes and today is one of those days I have been saved all day I said today is one of those Today is one of those days. I'm always pursuing holiness and I'm always pursuing godliness. But the truth is sometimes in our pursuit we come up short. You know, we all deal with some sort of affliction. Glory be to God. Chosen and, and afflicted. And without having this discussion, it will make you question your assignment in God. How can you be so anointed rebuking demons and still battling depression? can you have faith for everybody else but you're dealing with anxiety concerning your own personal future and sometimes your affliction will make you question am I really called for this am I really anointed I'm just gonna talk out loud y'all don't want to be honest with me in here sometimes your own personal affliction will make you question did God make the right call when he called me until I read a scripture that made me leap in my spirit when it says many are the afflictions of the righteous not the hula but the righteous not the har harlot but the righteous screaming somebody tell him I must be righteous my affliction announces my anointing that's why the Bible says when the righteous cries because there's a different sound that comes from people 
who've had to endure affliction. I can tell some of y'all in this room, you ain't never had to deal with nothing. You ain't never had to fight no demons. You ain't never had to do no warfare. But if you ever need a breakthrough, get somebody who's had to conquer their own afflictions. And when the righteous cry, my God, hallelujah. That's why when God sent Moses to Egypt, he says, tell my people two things. Tell them, number one, I've seen their affliction, but I've heard their cry. I need to hear the sound of those who've had to deal with captivity but you still want to live I need to hear the sound of those who've almost lost your mind but you still want sanity push somebody tell them God hasn't changed his mind then captivity and called and chosen uh and listen why the Lord says he wants to bring them out they're chosen I want to bring them out and when I read the scripture it just really blessed me but it also um, created more questions <laughs> it says I want to bring them out of captivity so they can worship me God says I want to bring the Israelites out of captivity so they can worship me so that sounds great in the beginning but then it makes me ask questions what have they been doing the whole time you can't tell me they haven't been singing the whole time somebody been singing somebody been praying but you say you want to bring them out so they can worship that tells me there's a different type of worship that you give God when he bring you out of it if you can praise him in captivity, imagine what kind of praise you're going to give him when he cancels your debt by Monday. If you can praise him sick in your body, how are you going to be able to praise him when he rebukes cancer out of your blood? Come on. He said, there's another, there's another level of worship that I want to get out of you and I got to bring you out of the place you've been in. Because the truth is, in our culture, we have redefined worship. We really have. We make worship synonymous with singing. So if I said, come on, y'all, let's worship the Lord. It was like, hallelujah, Lord, we worship you. There's nothing wrong with that. that. That's an expression of worship. But that's not worship. Because you can fake the lyrics, but you can't fake worship. You can fake a dance, but you can't fake worship. When we see worship in the scripture, worship is introduced to us in scripture when God tells Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain to lay him down. And Abraham calls it worship. We have a whole lot of people singing the songs, but I don't see no blood. A whole lot of people singing the songs, but there is no sacrifice. It's not, y'all ain't got tight on me in this section right here. It ain't worship until it costs you something. And that's why some folk, they can do all the antics and the acrobats, but there's no oil because there's no crushing. I need you to look at somebody, tell them I paid for this. And tell them, and I'm still making payments. Come on, I'm still making payments. People want you, but they don't want your stuff. They want your stuff but they don't want your sacrifice and that's why just because you walk in somebody's style don't mean you have their mantle the mantle is connected to the consecration the mantle is connected to the decisions that you've had to make against your own desires what have you had to give up that you wanted What, if it, what have you had to give back to God that God gave to you? Then that's, that's worship. He says, I want to bring them out because there's another level of worship I want, I want out of them. They're out of captivity, but they're in a different place now. On your way to a promised land, not just a random land, but a land that has been promised. 
and they find themselves in an in-between place because most of us don't have an issue with the moment of prophecy or the moment of prophetic fulfillment but most of us in this room are navigating the middle and when you find yourself in the middle that means you find yourself in a place that looks nothing like what God said yeah you fell out on the floor over the prophecy your dream was very vivid you got lured in with great expectation just to be in this no man's land and you feel guilty when you want to complain because it ain't captivity <sighs> but it also ain't promise either and in those moments you'll start to question did you miss the moment did I stay too long my god because if it was going to happen for me it would have happened by now but I come to speak to about 35 of you in this room to tell you that time does not intimidate God as a matter of fact God uses time he uses time and so how do you navigate and this weekend the Lord spoke to me as I was preparing to come down tonight he says this weekend I want to give some people in this room answers yeah, I know that. I know. <laughs> now, some of you, that's a, that was a quick name. Some of you, like, oh, okay. Thought you were going to say, God going to make me a millionaire. <laughs> no. Because I can endure a season as long as I need to endure it, as long as I got answers. I don't want to waste a season. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my seed. I don't want to waste investing my energy and heart into something that's not God. I need instructions. I want to make sure I don't miss the turn. Yeah. And so while they're in this middle place, God tells Moses, come up here. Now they can't come, but you come. And this is why you had some people that were supposed to come with you to power to live conference. And at the last minute they dropped out. But you said, I'm sorry, I got to go. Because many are called, but few have chosen. My, hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I had to be here. If I weren't on the program, I needed to be here. I, 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 God is summonsing me. This is what makes the ministry of Prophet, Prophetess Barbara Calloway so special because it's birthed out of prayer. See, we have a lot of ministries that are the brainchild of marketing teams and they got all the aesthetics. They got the image, but they ain't got the power. Hallelujah. Give me a conference or give me a gathering of people who want God and not just want image. Come on, somebody. We have a lot of idols being lifted up in this hour, but let me tell you, God, there is no God like our God. And when we talk about idol worship, many of us think I'm talking about Buddhists and I'm talking about Hindus. But let me tell you something. We got more idols in the Western Christian church than any other country and any other religion. But I declare to you that every idol is coming down. I don't care if it's your bishop or your apostle or your ideology or your religious structure, your denomination or your system. There's no God like our God. The Bible says Moses was summoned. He was summoned. And this is why some of us are being so physically, psychologically, and emotionally drained. It's because we're trying to do spiritual assignments out of our flesh. No, no. This is one you got to birth out. This is one you got to dig out. This next thing God is about to do in your life, you don't have to have the masses. Get the prayer warriors together. Y'all got to dig this thing out. This ain't going to come through another conference. This is going to come from a prayer meeting. This is going to come between you pacing back and forth between the porch and the altar. This thing is going to come out of the spirit. Zerubbabel, how will this happen? Zechariah says, not by might. Oh, hallelujah. Not by power, but by my spirit. Say it the Lord. Mm. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, this is spiritual. This is spiritual. Come up here. You in the middle place. You need instructions. You need you need instructions. I don't want to keep doing this without God instructions. I want to build it like God told me to build it. I want to do it like God told me to do it. Because you can't kill your giants with Saul's armor. 
you need God's instruction some of us have looked at other people's lives and we've been distracted by the way they do it but I need you to look at somebody and you tell them do it like God told you to do it I don't care if it don't make sense to the people around you you may have to look like a fool but sometimes favor will make you look like a failure until God shifts it and everybody will mimic you you're not hearing what I'm saying tell your neighbor do it like God told you to do it say it like God told you to say it you are unique and you got to follow the instructions fire on the altar after water is poured out follow the instructions break it then give it you got to follow you got to follow the instructions and the Bible says when he came down with the tablets when he came down with the Decalogue when he came with the word of the Lord the Bible says he saw something among the people because God hadn't spoken quick enough they start creating their own God yeah. let's look at this this happens after they come out of Egypt it is three months after Passover glory be to God and so where they are now when the law and the Torah is given is it's, it's Pentecost. This is our first Pentecost. Because Pentecost is not just about us shouting. Pentecost is about a download of strategy. Because if I lay in the floor and I get up with no more than what I had when I laid down, I should have just sat in the chair. I need you to grab somebody by the hand and tell her I'm getting answers this weekend. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. I want to get in the spirit and let God reveal some things. Don't you know when you get in the Holy Ghost, he'll, he'll show you some things. You'll be able to separate your friends from your enemies. If you get in the spirit, you'll be able to hear conversations without being in the room. When you, uh, when you get in the spirit, you'll be able to identify Jezebel and Athaliah. When you get in the spirit, you'll be able to expose the spirit of Ahab in the house. When you get in the spirit, God will show you some things. You'll be able to find money that you didn't know was even in the house. I said, when you get in the spirit, he'll give you divine strategy. So it's Pentecost. It's Pentecost when Moses comes down with the Torah. But because the people had created an idol, it created a separation. Do you Bible scholars, you know this. God's original plan was that the elders of every home in Judaism would be the priest of the Lord. But this was a defining moment. It was the Levites that gravitated to Moses when he came down with the Torah and because the Levites made a decision he says I'm going to make you priest because they made a decision and in this weekend this is a decision making weekend mm. you've got to make up in your mind whether you're going to do this for real or not because there is there's a whole lot of mixture in the church now and every time we talk about the spirit of compromise we always talking about the teenagers in the back of the church but there's a lot of compromise on the platform there's a lot of compromise with titles this is why I, I don't even hang out with every preacher because every preacher is not saved did you hear what I said every there are some preachers that are not Save y'all ain't got title me. I'm gonna say it anyway. There are some people who can prophesy accurately and they are not saved. But the Bible says in that day many will say, Lord, Lord, not I tried to prophesy, but I did prophesy, I did cast out devils, and he'll say, Depart from me. I know you're not. So I'm not worried whether you call me archbishop, whether you call me episcopate, whether you call me presider, whether you call me prophet. At the end of the day, it's important to me that after all of this church I am saved I mean this for real because there's some people who do this but they no longer believe in this it's a check it's a gig I'm not just talking about musicians there are prophets who treat church like a gig but God is coming for the church prostitutes he's coming for the church pimps God wants somebody that's real scream at somebody tell them I'm not 
perfect, but I still believe in this. I'm not always holy, but I still believe in holiness. I'm not always right, but I still believe in righteousness. And before I compromise, I tell the truth even against myself. got to make some decisions I said we got to make some decisions I said we got to make some decisions do you want presentation or do you want power you got to make some decisions hey you got to make some decisions are you trying to play into the people or you're trying to serve the one I said the one the one the one because at the end of the day if he's not pleased the Levites made a decision they made a decision to come close and three thousand died because they wanted their idol what are you going to do when you are faced with the decision because many of us see this is what I found when I when I preach in India so early on when I was doing and planting uh, churches and doing ministry in India early on I had this sense this false sense of success <laughs> We can talk about it another time and really unpack what I mean by false sense of success. I give it to you in a nutshell. I would preach in these villages. And when I did an altar call, it was so refreshing because when you're in a Western culture, you're preaching the gospel, but more like a reference to the gospel. Because everybody has heard some sense of it before, right? As a matter of fact, what we call church growth in our country most of the time is church transplants oh we just growing over here yeah 20 of them came from them 10 of them came from that you know <laughs> so it's it's so refreshing I hope i'm not boring y'all just stay with me one second uh, so it was so refreshing to preach jesus just in a very elementary and potent way because the truth is some of us can't preach the gospel no really and we had a discussion right now and passed the mic around and says come on let's preach the gospel just preach just preach the gospel people will start saying he'll make a way out of no way well yeah he will but what's the gospel the gospel is not he'll make a way out of no way the gospel is he is the way he is the way out of no way <laughs> No, what's you know what is what is the gospel? You know, you know. Tell me about the immaculate, the, the, the virgin birth. Uh, uh, you know, he who knew no sin became. Oh my child! Tell me about without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Tell me about when I was polluted in my own blood. Whew, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just the gospel. And so for me to be able to share the gospel in these villages and in, in some large cities like Hyderabad and Rajamundry and to watch groves of people respond, especially in the first few years, I was like, man, I'm leaving America. I'm preaching it. I'm just going to live in India. I'm serious. I, I, my first time going, I almost, because I started my church in April 2005, the first church, and in June, two months later, I went on a mission field. So I almost, when I came back, I went to my pastor. I said, I messed up. He said, what is it? I said, I'm called to be a missionary. I didn't know I could be one. I made a mistake. I said, because I, I thought missionaries were just women who were white. I, I want to be a missionary. And Bishop looked at me. I had tears in my eyes. That's why you got to have good covering. Because I was in the spirit. And I was crying. And Bishop said, no. He said, get sober, get sober. He said, no, no, God calling you to the nations. But he's putting a burden on you for the nations because if you don't have the burden, then you can't put it on your people. And that's why my church went from being called Ram Church to Ram Church International. I have an issue with people who call their church international and they don't even pray for the nations. You don't even watch the news. You don't even know what's going on in other countries. You can't be international. You're not citywide yet. The apartment or complex across the street don't even know y'all there. Y'all shut down a whole pandemic and nobody knew it. But although I saw what I thought was much fruit to 
the preaching of the gospel, as I continued to go back, I realized it wasn't what I thought it was. Because India is the largest idol worshiping country in the world, second largest populated country in the world. And so they are the largest idol worshiping country. I mean, they got idols for everything. So this is what I found out. When I said, accept Jesus, and they came to the altar to accept Jesus in hundreds, in the hundreds, I didn't realize they were taking Jesus and adding him to their other gods. Now, why are you looking at them with your nose up? This is what we're seeing in our Western church. Are we praising God? And our own images. Oh, we're praising God and our own idols. But this is a decision-making season. You're not going to use God to make you look God look good. He's going to use you to get the glory. You got to make a decision. Oh, you know, it's good in the story for us because we know how the story ends. But imagine following him. Leaving everything to follow him. And then he dies on you. I'm getting ready to preach a message soon called the Jesus we never knew. Because many of us are disappointed with Jesus. But the truth is we didn't understand his message. Yeah. Many of us have our own expectations of, on him. And our present theology has robbed us of ancient faith. Our present theology says, Lord, here is my faith. Give me what I want. And that, that will produce a good shout. Sanitize the prophetic. Because be honest, be honest with me here. Some of us are numb. The Bible said in the last days, many will depart. And it didn't say from the church. It said we'll depart from the faith. And my prayer is that God will resuscitate the faith of the generation that sits in church but don't believe it. You know why I know you don't believe it? By the way you live it. You can never live above your faith system. We are trying to make people live right but they don't believe the scripture. That's why we got to preach it again. Because the Bible said faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when I said preach it again, I'm not talking about preaching that your blessing is coming. I'm talking about preaching that the wages of sin is death but the gift of God. I need you to touch three people in your sex and tell them there's a better way of living. There's a better way of living. Don't put me in my promise if you're not going to address my problem. Thomas said, I don't want to hear this. Because I heard all of them parables. And I heard all that stuff. He's dead. Don't build up my expectation again just to be disappointed. And you know what? Church people can't handle that. They can't handle that because... When you're in that moment, we need you to hurry up and get past it so we'll feel better. We don't know how to minister to people that's in the in-between. We, we just need you to hurry up and shout. We have learned in Pentecostalism how to rejoice with those who rejoice. But we have flunked at knowing how to grieve with those who grieve. Mourn with those who mourn. If my mama die, don't you shout at the funeral until I shout. This is not a good service. This is not a shouting good time. You are here to support me. So if I cry, get you some tissue. Tell, don't tell me not to cry. You learn how to cry. Don't come with my, you don't have the answer for my situation. So sometime learn how to just be present and be quiet. If I'm not hungry, you're not hungry. Don't you come through my cabinets and eat all the chicken and the bread. You got to learn.
learn how to mourn with those who mourn because Jesus is willing to meet you right where you are. I'm talking to somebody who's been slipping in agnosticism. I'm talking about somebody who's been questioning the faith after all you've seen. And I know y'all want to talk about Thomas because Thomas was a doubter, but you got to consider what Thomas dealt with. We're dealing with a generation who watched their parents get divorced. We're dealing with the generation that watched Bishop slip out of his marriage. You're looking at a generation who watched some things that they put their hope in no longer exist. This is a generation. Some of us in this room, see some of y'all love, y'all love information, but there's some of us in this room, we know more than we ever wanted to know. That's why when people come to me, I, I distance myself. Like, child, let me tell you. No, if it ain't got nothing to do with me, I don't want to hear it. Do you know, you know the stuff I have to hear that I don't want to hear? That I have to ask God to let me forget? Don't judge Thomas. Look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, don't judge Thomas. You don't know what Thomas has been. You don't know what Thomas has seen. Because the same person who preached to Thomas molested Thomas. Don't you, don't judge Thomas. Because Thomas is broken because of what he experienced in the place that was supposed to be a safe place. And Thomas said, no, I ain't going to believe it. I'm not going to believe it until I put my hands where they put the nails at. Because I saw them put the nails in his hand. I'm not going to believe it until I can touch his feet. And God cared enough about Thomas. He was so not intimidated by Thomas that Jesus came back again and walked through closed doors. And I know some of us will always say, if you got enough faith, he'll show up. But I need a hundred of y'all to just praise God because he showed up even the moments you didn't have faith for. It. Uh oh. Oh, come on. I said, praise him for the moments that you were in so much disbelief but he still showed up in rooms with closed doors and I need uh, I was in my stuff I was in my head I was in my emotions and he still showed up I need you to get out of your seat and run over to somebody and tell him he showed up for me let me just be honest with you I can, I can tell you how, how I sowed the seed and I reaped the harvest I can tell you how I praised him and the blessing came down but let me be honest with you there were sometimes I didn't have the strength to praise him there were sometimes I didn't have the strength to pray for he showed tell somebody he showed up for me 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 he showed up for me. I'm sorry, I just had a flashback. He showed up for me. I tell somebody I was in a messed up place. But he showed up for me. See, some of y'all think we shout because we've been perfect. No, I shout because he saved me in the process. I'm just going to give you 15 seconds. I want you to praise him now for how he showed up when your faith was weak. No, when your faith was weak and he still... This ain't the way I thought this message was going to go. The Bible said that after resurrection, he could have simply went up. But sometimes we don't take the time to preach about the duration period. Right, right. 40 days. Where he's showing himself with infallible proofs that he was the same Jesus. I need you to look at somebody and tell them, I am the evidence of the resurrection. <laughs> I don't need no relics. I am the evidence of the resurrection. I wasn't there when they pierced him, but I am the evidence of the resurrection. 40 days walking around cooking fish <laughs> showing us uh, a glorified body hallelujah 
enough to be recognized, but different enough to walk in rooms without using doorknobs. Yeah, hallelujah. Don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended. <laughs> what are you talking about, Yeshua? You haven't yet ascended. 40 days. He's ministering, talking about things to come. And within those 40 days, he looked at his disciples and said, Received ye the Holy Ghost. And when he blew on them, they didn't fall out. Because if the right preacher blow on you, you're supposed to fall out. He blew on them and they didn't speak in tongues. He just said, Receive the Holy Ghost. And what happened? Nothing. I'm preaching to somebody that all you got is a word but no activity. And nothing. Nothing happened. And the Bible says, he said, now I must go. They said, uh-uh, don't you go. Because you did this before. He said, no, he said, no, no. If I don't pull away from you, the next level will not come. I will not leave you fatherless or comfortless. I will come to you. Now that's complicated. Because you're saying you're leaving, but you're coming. You said another comforter, but another comforter is you. <laughs> instructions without revelation many of us in this room we just follow the instructions we don't know how he's going to do it we don't know where it's coming from but tell your neighbor it's coming it's coming and then the bible said this the bible said that he says i must have sinned and and he says but follow the instructions now you go to jerusalem and you stay there until i endow you with power from on high and after that the holy ghost has come upon you ye shall have power and when we preach that usually we stop right there but listen to the rest of it to be witnesses it ain't power for us to show each other how much more saved we are than everybody else it's power to be witnesses in jerusalem Judea, Samaria, come on Bible church and to the uttermost parts of the world power hallelujah hmm, glory be to God and he went up and he stood there the angel says oh man of Galilee why stand here gazing the same Jesus I love the gospel church the same Jesus and the Bible says they went to Jerusalem. Not all of them. <laughs> Over 500 of them got the instructions, but only 120 showed up. Tell your neighbor, everybody is not going to show up. Paul said, I became all things. Obedience is your responsibility, and the results belong to God. <laughs> I'm not screaming, but I want you to catch what I'm saying in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says the 120 went to the, uh, to the upper room. Some say Solomon's porch, Mount Zion, <laughs> a high place. In the first Pentecost, it was Sinai. In this Pentecost, it's Zion. It all tells us that some experiences are only take place at higher altitudes. Mount of Transfiguration. Where Peter, James, and John saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. My question is, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? There was no Facebook. But there are some things you understand at higher altitudes. And that's why this weekend God is calling us high. Hey! God is calling us high. So they go up on Mount Zion. They go to the upper room. Don't touch me. I haven't ascended. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, <sighs> they were all in one place with one accord. And there came. 
the high priest the high priest would wear an ephod a servant's garment a high priest would wear a mitre bishop white and the inscription on the mitre says holiness unto the lord glory be to god the high priest would hold it all together hallelujah uh, would be girded that oh the high priest would have a breastplate with the 12 stones of Asher, Benjamin, Dan, Ephraim. Come on, somebody. 12 stones symbolizing when you go into the holy place, you're taking the people with you. It's the posture of an intercessor. Yes. But the high priest had pomegranates yes, and bells yes, tied to the skirt. Yes, hmm. God. Hallelujah. And when you go in, hallelujah, there was a sound when the high priest, hallelujah, glory be to God, that there will be a sound that, that will be on the garment of the high priest when they went in, 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 in the holy place. And, 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 the, and the way we know that the blood, hallelujah, was received and the sacrifice was accepted because there was a sound. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place with what don't you touch me? I gotta see it. And they were all in one place with one accord, and suddenly there came a sound. A sound. What kind of sound? A sound from heaven as a Russian mighty. What God is about to do, He's about to make sense out of the season of your life that didn't make sense some of you were following instructions without a whole lot of information and then hey that, that when he blew on them in John chapter 20 then they understood in Acts chapter 2 that this is that that was spoken I need you to grab your neighbor by the hand and tell him God is about to make sense out of the chaos he's about to make sense out of the instruction oh, there's a sound that's coming out of you. I need you to look at your neighbor and say, don't lose it. Don't lose it. There's a sound that he's put in your belly. There's a sound of Pentecost. And that sound is not the sound of tamarinds. There's a sound of Pentecost. And it's not the sound of washboards. I thank God for the Hammond organ. But the Hammond organ is not the sound of Pentecost. But the sound of Pentecost is the approval of God. I want you to grab your neighbor by the hand. Huh? and tell me everybody don't have to like you huh? but make sure God is pleased with you I want to do it like God said do it huh? I want to make sure huh, that I carry out this assignment huh, like he put it in me huh? I don't have to be huh, everybody's favorite preacher huh? but at the end of the day huh, I don't want to lose the sound I don't want to lose the sound Use technology But don't lose the sound Put up screens But don't lose the sound Grab your neighbor Neighbor by the hand And said, oh neighbor There's a sound In your belly There's a sound In your throat And Jesus said Believe on me of living water pull on your neighbor said oh neighbor don't lose it don't lose it fight through what you gotta fight because the sound in you is the sound of deliverance the sound in you is the sound of intercession and it wasn't created from a youtube clip it wasn't created from a track but down on my knee between the porch and the altar grab somebody and tell them I suffered to produce this sound it may not be popular it may not be modern but when, when, when I open up my mouth walls come down when I open up my mouth bodies are healed scream at somebody tell them don't shut your mouth if you stop shouting, somebody will die. If you stop crying, somebody will be destroyed. But when, 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 when the righteous cry, I said, when the righteous cry, let me hear the sound. Let me hear the sound of Pentecost. We're coming up on the 50th day. This is the day where cycles are broken. This is the hour where bodies are healed. This is the announcement that a new season has just been ushered in. Grab 
somebody and tell them it's time to move. It's time to move. You've been stuck long enough. You don't have to die where they dropped you. Scream at somebody and tell them it's Pentecost. It's Pentecost. And this Pentecost has different looks. This Pentecost has different styles. But this Pentecost has the same sound. Somebody open up your mouth and shout now. Put a shofar in your mouth. Put a shofar. Put it in the room. Put it in the room. I said put it in the room. This is an Everybody couldn't get in this room tonight because I'm not a false prophet and I didn't want nobody to come here to be a false receiver. There's one word the Lord wants to speak over you tonight. Hear me, hear me. I love the sound of classical Pentecostalism. But don't forget, the sound of the pomegranates says Jehovah received the sacrifice. The sound was a response to obedience. Hear me. Mm. There was a, a y'all know the, the first martyr of the church. Who was that? That's Stephen. He looked up. And when he looked up, he saw Jesus standing. This, this whole message is for this one moment. I want you to hear me. Don't you tap out. You hear me? This is why you came to this conference. I want you to hear this. There's a, uh, there's a story about this musician who played his violin piece at a, at a big theater in New York. And after he played, he walked off the stage and everybody was screaming and yelling and saying, encore, encore. And he shook his head. He was like, I didn't do good. And the stage manager was like, what are you talking about? Don't you hear the sound of the people? He said, I didn't do good. He said, how can you say you didn't do good? Don't you hear the people shouting? He said, no, I didn't do good because look at that man sitting on the front row. He said, you tell me you're going to decide you didn't do good because of one man sitting on the front row? He said, yes. He said, because that one man is my instructor. What does it matter if everybody else claps? But he's not standing. I want you to lay your hand. I want you to lay your hand on the shoulder. Mm. We're about to release the sound of Pentecost in this room. I want you to communicate this to the person beside you. Tell them after everything you've endured. Tell them you didn't do everything right. Tell them you weren't perfect, but you stuck it out. Tell them one word of Pentecost for you. Tell them the Lord says, approved, approved. Said about you, you could have got messy, but God said. 
chapter 1 verse 8 says, ye should have power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. The whole point of this YouTube channel, or however you're watching this message, is to be a witness of Jesus. It's to reveal Jesus to people in a deeper, wider, and greater way. So I pray that some kind of way through this message today, Jesus has been revealed to you in a deeper way. Uh, I want to pray for you. Lord, I just ask you right now, for those who are watching, to those who are listening to my voice, I'm asking you by your spirit to touch them right where they are. Someone is at a crossroad in their life and they need direction. And I'm asking you, Lord, be their navigation because to a million questions, Lord, you are the answer. And so I'm asking you, Lord, by your spirit to shut every door you don't want them to go into, but only to grant them access to divine doors. Lord, someone may be listening and they're sick in their body. And Lord, your word says, by your stripes we are healed. And so Lord, right now I speak your healing name, Jesus, over their physical body, over their mind and over their heart. Lord, if there's someone that's watching that don't know you in the pardoning of their sins, I'm asking you now, let them cry out your name. Let them say, Lord, save me. And I'm asking you, Lord, as you are so willing to do, meet them right where they are. I thank you, Father, before we touch it, before we experience it, before we see with our eyes, we thank you that we already have what we have prayed for. And I speak these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you were blessed today, you like to communicate with us because we love getting your emails. We love getting your letters. Take time to send us one right now. Pastor at the rampchurch.org. Or you can send us a letter at 701 Thomas Road, Lynchburg, Virginia. 24502. Our ministry has been expanding. And yes, by the power of God, but also by your partnering. You have been partnering with God. Some of you have been sowing seeds. You've been giving offerings. And so if today, if you would like to sow a seed to continue to bless our ministry, to partner with what we're doing domestically and all around the world, take time. There are ways to give on the screen. And remember, you know, whatever you sow, you'll reap. But don't just always give to get give because you're able to give you've been blessed to give let god trust you to be a resource this is bishop sy younger and i look forward to connecting with you soon go with god because he's always going with you